thank you, Christoph, for uh, joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Um, Christoph is an assistant professor of statistics in the Department of Advanced Computing Sciences at the University of Maastricht and the principal investigator in the Center of Experimental Rheumatology at the University Hospital of Zurich and the University of Zurich. He received his academic training at Stanford University in Ria, Sofia, and Tipolis, and the University of Bern. And today he will talk to us about Holt's discovery rates, a review, and some new ideas. Thank you, Christa. Thank you. So I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I see some nodding hats, that's good. Most of the people here in the room, welcome. Um, so today what I want to talk about is basically uh, in the first part, I want to review visually what false discovery rates are because most people in the room or online might already know or at least guess what they are. So I'm gonna give you a visual uh, angle on how it how they look like, at least for me. And um, in the second part will be I will share some research that we uh, did together at Maastricht University on, uh, on a new way to quantify uncertainty in a prediction setting. So very different from the way we usually use false discovery rates on models, but more on prediction. So these are the two things I want to do today. Okay, so the first slide, this was a very interactive slide. Um, now with the questioning, I'm not sure how to do it, but um, I want to start, so the way I usually start is with data, okay? This slide is a visualization of data. So I don't know if you, what you see here when you look at it, like a Rorschach test, you know, what do you see in this, on this, on this plot? Um, you see here this vertical dashed line, and that's a, a specific data point that I calculated, calculated using, using an average of 10 numbers, okay? And the value is, I don't know, 0.6 or something like that. So this is a, the data point. And um, with your experiments, you know, data comes from all kinds of places and uh, you calculate averages or all other things that are more complicated than that. But here, uh, to visualize the idea, this is, the, this is the data that I have. Now, data by itself is only, only of limited use, right? We have to kind of relate it to something, right? So what we usually do is we create a null distribution. Okay, we have a null distribution of uh, all the possible data points that I, I could have seen if I reran the experiment many, many, many times. Okay, so uh, you have an experiment here um, where I don't expect anything interesting to happen. And uh, if I rerun it many, many times, I get this histogram that we call the null distribution. Okay, and one plus, uh, one outcome here that I indicated this is vertical dash line. That's one specific uh, outcome that I received when I ran the experiment once. Now, when I have these two things, when I have a, an observed data point and I have this null distribution, I can compare those two things together, okay? And this is what we do when we calculate, calculate the p-value, right? We look at the, the uh, what's the probability of having observed this, this data point? Um, at least this or more extreme version of that. And then we calculate something like these tail probabilities. So the, these, uh, uh, green, the green area of this histogram is the p-value in, in case we don't assume it, uh, the directionality of the effect that we are studying. So this is uh, my visual illustration of the p-value and where they come from, okay? And those are the p-values that we, they come from all kinds of places from animal experiments, from human experiments, from signal cell RNA sequencing, all the way to, to pixels and images. And we need to process them in some way, okay? And so the p-value is very old. It's a whole old story, uh, maybe more than a hundred years ago. And um, more recently, we tried to understand how can we um, process data when we have a lot of p-values? How do we handle the situation where we have a lot of hypotheses that we're testing and we have a lot of p-values? Um, so in general, the recipe that I want you to keep in mind for p-values is this, these three steps. First, we define some kind of hypothesis that will um, define um, what the, the thing of interest that we're trying to study. Then second, we will create a non -mo null model. 
then we will derive the, the null distribution. Sometimes that's theoretical the derivation. Sometimes this is a simulation. The way I did it before was by simulation. And then we calculate the probability um, of, of you observing a specific value on the null. This is what I showed you before with these uh, colorful um, pale probabilities. So this is the usual setup that we that we have that most people are familiar with. Now I want to ask another question, where um, basically when, when we study false discovery rates, uh, what we actually are asking ourselves is, what happens if we have many many p-values? And um, and what we need to, from a statistics point of view, what we need to understand is what is the distribution of p-values? What do we expect? How do how do they? What kind of distribution do they follow? Is it a name distribution? Is it some weird, you know, empirical thing? Who knows? Okay. So I want you to picture in your mind the situation where we um, we do something like before. So we have uh, an experiment we run repeated many many times, and we assume that the experiment there's no effect. Okay, there's zero interesting things going on. We just we sample basically from the null distribution whenever we run the experiment. So we do this many, many times, 10,000 times. Um, and every time we calculate the p-value in the same way that uh, the way I showed you before. So we, we look where does the observation fall um, in the distribution, and then we calculate what's the probability of having observed this value or a more extreme value. And then we do this uh, 10,000 times, let's say, and then we can, we can make a histogram of all these p-values. We can look at them, what is the distribution of all these p-values? And now the question is, what shape does it have? Anybody know? Normal distribution. We have a normal distribution once. Any other? Um... I ran the simulation. And uh, the next slide is to give you another second to think about it. Uniform, the most beautiful one that we have. So. Whenever you sample, if you have a, a null ex, an experiment and you have a, there's nothing interesting going on, and you you just observe from the null distribution, you observe these uh, statistics, you calculate the p-values. What you do when you do this many many times, you actually have a uniform distribution of p-values. So here, these are hundreds and thousands of p-values that I plotted, and they are basically the histogram of these. And it's a little bit, you know, it's not perfectly uniform because it's a simulation, it's 10,000, you know, repetitions. But if you repeated it a million times, it will be perfectly uniform. We can even prove this. It's a, but we proved this when we learn like intro to probability, which we all forgotten probably by now. But at one point you proved this, okay? It's very, very easy. Um, um, it's this, uh, this general fact from probability. And this is, this, this fact is what uh, we use to, to derive the false discovery rate that I'm going to show you in the next step. So far, so good. Here's a real example. So here's a real example of, um, so this is my simulation when nothing interesting happens in an experiment. Now I'm looking at something, a real gene expression experiment where the p-value, there is about 10,000 p-values, 15,000 p-values, one p-value per gene in a machine expression study. So we have 10,000 p-values and we do the same. We, we calculate the p-value in some similar way that I did in the first part. And then we do a, we make a little histogram like this. And you see, it's not really perfectly uniform anymore. It's the real world, okay? So it's probably, you know, something's different from, from my perfect setup in the simulation. And what you notice is maybe two things. So here, the main bulk that you see here is kind of uniform here, right? Not bad. Here on the left, the left tail here is, uh, is really a large um, number of, of p-values are in this bin, the very left, okay? And you see here also some strange ones that are popping up here all over the place. And basically, um, so this is actually really good news if you have something like this, because what it means is, um, the same way that you have a uniform distribution if there's nothing interesting going on in your experiment, what happens uh, when there's something going on is you have actually a really large number of p-values here on the left. That means there's a lot of low p-values, which low usually is good, 
okay? So it means in this experiment, in this gene expression experiment, there is some interesting biology going on. So some of these genes are doing something interesting in the experiment that we are studying. And how do we, from this, how do we calculate what do we mean by interesting, okay? So I cannot just say, here is the histogram, it looks interesting, and that's it, right? We want to quantify what we mean by that. And the way the, um, the FDR procedure works, the visual version, there's a lot of different ones, but the visual version works like this, is what we do is we basically fit uh, a uniform distribution to this. Um, here, it's not really that perfect, but you know that's how we do it. So it's a, it's a noisy, you know, noisy data set. So we, we fit a uniform distribution as well as we can to this distribution. And then um, what we're looking at is we are choosing some some points here on the x-axis, and then we calculate um, what is the proportion of total cases that we have up to this red vertical line. Um, we will calculate that and we will calculate how many, what's the proportion of uninteresting genes among all the genes that we have in this bin. Okay, so I, I did a little, uh, try to do a little illustration of this. It's kind of the illustration version of that. And you see here, it's the same. So this is now a very continuous looking histogram okay, because there's many, many p-values. This yellow vertical line is the uniform distribution that we fit. Here, we don't have this messy stuff. Okay, it's so, yeah, idealization. Um, but we have, what you usually see is this uh, large amount of, of p-values here in the lower end um, when it's something interesting is going on. And what the FDR basically says is, what we are doing is we are taking, we are calculating the, the area under the curve until P, so this blue shaded area, and we calculate what's the the, the number of uh, p-values that we ex expect if nothing interesting is going on. That would be the uniform case, right? It's that's the null case when nothing interesting is happening, and we will we divide that nothing is going on divided by all the things that are going on, and that's the number of the proportion of of uh, false discoveries that we have among all the discoveries. So the whole blue shaded area is all the discoveries, all the things that we uh, think are interesting. Um, but we know that this part here is not interesting. And like this, we can calculate the proportion of uninteresting versus all, all of the cases that we declare. And this is the called the false discovery rate in a visual, visual way. And as you see, it's a function of P. So if you move P around here, you would, this false discovery rate would change, okay? And uh, it's also a, a quantity that is specific for a set. So it's not, you're not declaring one specific p, uh, hypothesis or p-value as interesting or not interesting. You always have a set of p-values that you, as a collective, you say, this is interesting with some false discovery rate of some number, okay? So it's always about sets, not about individual uh, p-values or hypotheses. But yes. You need to have a lot of experiments that produce each one produces a p value and then you can make it. Yes, you need to have, uh, so you cannot, so in the old fashioned way where we just have one hypothesis, you run the experiment, you get one p value, there, there's nothing, you cannot do anything, right? You need to be able to, to have some kind of histogram like, like this. And you can only instruct it if you have many, many uh, p values. The better, the more you have, the better you can estimate the uniform distribution and uh, the false discovery rate. Yeah, that's why it got really, I think where it really took off is in genetics, um, where you have a lot of so gene expression experiments, where usually you have 15,000 p-values, one per gene, per, per gene. And that's where it was really, you know, the numbers were big enough to, to do this. But also in imaging, if you think about pixels, um, and maybe you take pixels that are large enough so that they're independent of each other, then you can also think of uh, p-values as, as you know, uh, spatially contiguous uh, things in, a, in an image. And then you have, of those, you have also thousands per, um, per image. So this is really the, the key is that you have, that you have somehow actually, the, the, the good thing is if you have many hypotheses, not just one. So that was kind of the shift uh, from People at the beginning thought it was bad to have uh, many, many hypotheses. It was just randomly looking around for something, but it turns out statistically, this is actually really interesting. We can, we can use that to do something different than in the old days. 
Okay, that's, that's my, um, my visual introduction to false discovery rates. There, um, there are also other, other versions of this um, available. And uh, usually most R, R packages and Python packages don't um, estimate it in this visual way. There is a, another procedure that is more common, um, but it has the same properties, mathematically speaking. And um, yeah, so from, from, from an intuitive point of view, I think this is the nicest way to think, to think about it. If you want to know more, I would, um, so this is a bit of a commercial. I didn't, I was not part of this book, right? Uh, writing this book, but um, Susan Holmes and Wolfgang Huber are two uh, researchers in biology and statistics who wrote a book, Modern Statistics for Modern Biology. And uh, it has, so I'm, I'm using all the, a lot of ideas for, to introduce this, uh, this visual aspect of FDR from that book. There's a lot of um, code in the book that you, you can just copy paste and try it out yourself. And it's explained in a kind of, in a nice, in a nice intuitive way, but with a lot of statistical meat, okay? There's a lot of, uh, it connects to real deep things that we know in statistics, but it's connecting them to, um, to real data sets and real biological questions. So this would be my, my recommendation as a, as a book to, it's free online and uh, very, very nice. Okay, so this was my first part on the, kind of the older way of doing uncertainty quantification. Um, FDR, I, I think, were invented around 1995. Uh, so it's almost uh, 30 years, right? Um, um, so it's, yeah, not super old, but um, also not just yesterday. Okay, any more, are there any questions for the first part? Or we should I take them later? Any, but uh, we will okay. discuss later. <laughs> So I will move on to the next one. Um, this is something that I'm doing since basically I moved to Maastricht. Uh, in Maastricht, uh, the department is uh, it's heavy on computer science, which means that uh, it's a lot about prediction instead of estimation of parameters in the model, okay? And so most um, researchers in, that, in a setting like that will try to to turn a problem into a prediction problem, which uh, in the end is, uh, I think it's a really nice simplification of, of the world that we live in. And it actually has a lot of benefits to think about prediction instead of statistical estimation. And uh, here's my illustration. So usually what you have, you have some data matrix, some predictor matrix X, where the rows are cells or people. You have um, the columns are usually genes or pixels, depending on what, modality you work, work with. You have a machine, a machine learning black box that maps these predictors into a uh, outcome variable. It could be a disease label or it could be um, some label about uh, the outcome of, of your patients or cells. And so this, is, this could be a, a categorical variable. It could be a, a real number uh, depending on your setup. And what you do is you, you train this machine to predict Y from X, that's it. You don't really care how you do the prediction as long as the prediction error is small. That's the target, okay? And um, I, I was thinking about for a long time, how does statistics fit into this, okay? Where can we, do we, does it, are we still required in this new world of prediction or uh, what's our place? Uh, where do you need to do quantification of uncertainty in a similar way that, that we did with false, false copy rate? And, um, Basically, one, the project that I want to share with you today is a, is a prediction pro a project that I think highlights uh, important points that statistics can still provide in even a machine learning world, okay? So that's kind of my, kind of a commercial for, statis for statistics in machine, in doing statistics in machine learning. This is a work together with Christian. He was a, he's a bachelor and master student at Maastricht University. Now he's switched side and he's now a data scientist at ASML, a Dutch company who make a, an important piece of computer chips. Um, so he's now there, there making a lot of money. And um, so, but he, before he, uh, he started his job there, he, he worked on a, a project during his internship at the university 
And the internship was at this company, uh, Jutumba Visma. Well, the company is, uh, is Visma. And the team that you probably know from the Tour de France is Jutumba Visma. It's a, a professional cycling team. And they, uh, they won the tour, I think, in 2022 and 2023, OK? It's yeah. about the time when the stu my student was there um, working for, for Visma. So I'm not saying there is a you know, causal relationship, but there is for sure a correlation. Okay. And basically what he, um, what he worked on during his time there is to, to so the, the comp, they were sponsors of, of, uh, of the team, this company. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to build an algorithm to predict calorie consumption of the bicyclist. And they consume a huge amount of calories for an during an individual race. So I think it's around 3,500 calories for a race. So it's really, really, really uh, high. And they wanted to predict the calorie consumption so that they can somehow design the diet and the, the food that each rider has to eat before the, the race. And so they can kind of optimize food intake and hopefully win races. And, um, and the challenge here is not so much training the prediction method model to predict calories because uh, there's a lot of measurements about you know the, the specific race and the, the rider and how there's like these these different measurements to measure the pulse and the speed and all these things so there's a lot of information and uh, what's really challenging is that there are coaches involved in the decision that also have a lot of experience in the past they know yeah this person needs such and such amount of food and so they, they just know somehow, you know, intrinsically what is right, right? They don't maybe have a mathematical model for it, but they have a lot of knowledge. So the, the challenge is really to combine a black box machine learning prediction model with the experience of coaches. How do, how do you combine those two things together? It's really, that was kind of the, the interesting, challenging part in this budget. So I will show you how we, we tried to, we did that. So the setup was like this. We had basically, we didn't uh, calculate the, the calorie consumption directly. We calculated two uh, separate uh, variables that were then combined into a calorie prediction. So we calculated the speed and the, the power for, for each rider and then combined, um, we could calculate the energy, the calorie consumption. And uh, the predictors were the race type, the the stage profile, so if it's really a mountain um, style race or if it's very flat, the weather conditions on that day from uh, the forecast that we had for the weather, different attributes about the rider and then uh, the, the different styles of, of the different riders and, and all these things will impact how much calorie they, how many calories they con consume. And the target in this was the speed variable and the power variable that we had, that we wanted to predict. So this was the, the setup, and um, what, we, what we ended up doing in the end is something like this. So you see here, um, these are, it's not just the Tour de France, so this part here is the Tour de France. The first part is the Giro d'Italia. I don't know how well they did during the Giro d'Italia, to be honest. Um, but so here are the predictions for the speed. So for the speed variable, we actually predicted only the a, a, a kind of a team average for for uh, for a specific race, not for individual riders, because the speed is actually it's very very similar across riders. So it didn't really matter too much whether we made specific person predictions or team predictions. So that's why you see only one prediction per uh, stage of a of a race. So here, that's the second stage, third stage of the Giro. I don't know what happened to the first stage. Uh, it's not here. Uh, and then you see the, the Tour de France is the first stage, and then I don't know what happened to the second stage, the third stage is there. And importantly, what's, what you see here, I hope you see that, is we have the coach's predictions. These are the points in black. So before the race, the coaches predicted uh, what they think the speed will be. I don't know, I don't know how they did that, but they, they, have, they, get, they, have this, they gave this number. And then what we have is these two uh, other points. One is the model prediction is this uh, Machenta. So that's our, our random forest model predicted the calorie like that. 
And then the, after the race, we knew the true value, right? We could measure the average speed of, of the team. And that these are the these green points that you see here. And what we did is, in addition to uh, predicting just the, the green, uh, sorry, the, the magenta point estimate prediction, we also predicted the interval, okay? Like a prediction interval that tells us with some probability that the true that we cover the true value um, with some probability, and that's what you see here. These these intervals are prediction intervals for the predicted value. Okay, so it's kind of like confidence intervals, but not for model parameters, but for predicted values. Okay, this is kind of we're doing the same thing that we did in the the old days, but now just for the predictions instead of models. And uh, what you see, maybe one thing that you see is that coaches kind of underestimate um, a lot of times the, the speed for some reason. We, um, we do pretty well. So the, um, our model prediction is usually pretty close to the, to the true value, not always. And then our intervals are calibrated such that they cover 95% of the time the true value. So you will see that this should be approximately true in this in this plot that we are actually calibrating them such, in such a way that they cover the truth in 90, 95% of the time, okay, by design. And because if you want to cover the, you know, if you want to have complete coverage, you would have to have, make really wide intervals that probably are use, useless for decision making. If you have, if you, if you want to um, be really, really accurate. And so you have to find, kind of find the right balance of, of uh, coverage. And then, so the idea of this was uh, that we don't, you know, bite the coaches, right? This is not the idea. We want to use the coaches um, kind of knowledge and combine it with our prediction models. So the idea in the end that we had is the coaches can now basically, we will make the prediction intervals for them. The coaches will look at them and then we tell them you can pick any value on the interval and we guarantee to cover the truth in 90 or 95% of the time. So we give them a, a kind of a probabilistic statistical guarantee, um, but then we give them also the kind of the, the choice of picking any value on, their on the interval that, that you see. And um, so this is kind of, we can guarantee some things and they can still you know, choose what they like best. So this was our idea to combine these two worlds together. Now, um, to give you a quick uh, illustration, so the, the way we, we built these prediction intervals is a, a framework that is now really gotten very popular now in, in machine learning and also statistics. Um, it's gaining popularity uh, more and more. So the past couple of years, really the number of papers grew like crazy. Uh, it originally started in computer science, um, maybe 30 years ago. And about 10 years ago, the statisticians picked it up. And now um, everybody works on it. So it's kind of a happy community of everybody working together. And the framework is called conformal prediction. It's a, a, a framework that allows you to make these intervals and to have theoretical guarantees for the interval. Inter I'm going. I'm going to try to show you not the theory, but the, the idea, the way I understood it for the first time, how it, this really works and why. I'm gonna to try to illustrate uh, this idea. Okay, so this is the, the idea is uh, about, the, my illustration is about weather forecasting. And uh, I don't know if you asked yourself this question before, but whenever you have uh, on TV, back in the days, we had a forecast, a weather frog, right? For tomorrow, a person would say the chance of rain would be such and such. The chance of sun would be some some number. And in this universe here, there's only rain and there's only sun. And it either rains the whole day or it's sunny the whole day. There's no nothing in between, just to make it easy, okay? And so you see here on this first day, January 1st, we, um, we see the forecasting couple to make a prediction for tomorrow and they say there is a 40% chance of sun for tomorrow. Then we turn on the TV on January 2nd and they make another forecast, 20% chance of rain. And for every day, 
they make a forecast. Now, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, what, what is this percentage? What does it mean? Right? So in the end, in reality, it's just raining or it's, it's not raining. But what, what does this 40% mean? It's actually, it's a... The coverage of the area. One idea that I get this a lot is the, the coverage, how the percentage of, it, of the area that is raining and not raining. Could be. Uh, other, other ideas are that people use very complicated uh, physics models um, that are stochastic in some way and they run it. And then they count how many times does it does rain come out as the outcome for that day and how many times sun. So it's kind of like based on some physics model. That's another thing. Or maybe there's just the guy in the background who is like, yeah, tomorrow it's 40%. We don't know, right? We don't know. Um, so I, I now I will give you a way to basically, no matter how it's done, to calibrate it to something that at least I think it's under, it's kind of understandable. We know what it means. Okay, no matter whether it's a guy in the background or a, a physics model or the coverage, you can calibrate it to something that we know what it means. Um, because what we have is we have, once the, the year is passed, right? We actually know whether there's a, it, it either rained or it didn't in this artificial uh, world. But uh, this is this is what we have. So we have this is data, right, for tomorrow, um, and we we know we observe this kind of data. So so confirmed prediction basically uses the data. So the the thing that you can think about here is that in uh, in the difference between prediction and prediction models is that we actually see the observed outcomes. We we observe the outcomes. We see whether it's sunny or it's raining. It's not a latent uh, parameter in a physical model that we never see, okay? When we're, when we're trying to do an inference on a parameter in a, in a model, we, will ne we never get to see it. We only, only see a noisy version of that. But with prediction, we actually see the predicted out outcome. So we can just check, okay? And um, one way to check is, for instance, this way, where you filter out all the days where you have a 40% chance forecast for sun for tomorrow. And that's in Switzerland, maybe, I don't know, 100 times a year. And then you have 100 times a year where the forecast is at 40% chance of sun, right? And then to be able to understand what it means, we can actually just count the proportion of sunny days that actually occurred the next day. That's a number, that's a frequency style proportion number for the this probability, 40%. And then you can do it for every possible um, kind of forecast percentage, right? We can do it for every possible, and we can make a graph like this. So, so they say 40%, then there are 100 days in which you do prediction, and then you have, afterwards you say, okay, 40 days was actually sunny, and 60 days was rainy, and so there, this was correct. Yeah. If it's if that's the case, then it's perfectly calibrated in that sense. But uh, usually, pro it's probably not exactly like this. There might be some shift. Who knows uh, why? Uh, but exactly, it could be that it's perfectly calibrated. And so you do it for every possible threshold, for every possible uh, probability, and then you can make a graph like this. So you can draw on the x-axis. You can draw the the forecasting percentage. So in our case, forty percent. And on the y-axis, you can count the proportion. Here, I was a bit pessimistic, so I said it's uh, you know it's very, it's very it's, ideally it should be the identity line going through this. But here I said so actually what happened is seventy-five percent of sun of sun, okay. And then for every possible value on the x-axis, we would have a calibrated um, proportion if there's enough data, of course. Like if you don't have anything, then you can calibrate. And so this calibration curve here, um, this is basically how at the intuitive level, you calibrate the prediction intervals. So you, you make it so that they cover the truth um, with some percentage. And you do that on, a, on a, an additional split on the data. So usually you have a training and a test set. Now you also have a calibration set where you calibrate the uncertainty. 
And here, the, cal the calibration set would be a specific year where on which you, you calibrate. And you, you already see that there are some assumptions going on, right? You need to be able to, to exchange the years. If the year doesn't replicate in the future, if it's a really weird year, then if you calibrate it on that, you will get very strange um, prediction intervals. And so there needs to be a exchangeability between the different data sets that you use to calibrate and to test and to train. But if that's true, then you can actually, uh, you can use it and you have provably correct calibrated intervals that cover the true value with some specific percentage. So this is, but some version of this is what we use to create these intervals. That's why we know, that's why also when you saw before that actually the coverage is really close to what we, we, we targeted it to be um, because we calibrated it on a, on a calibration. And you can basically do this for for all kinds, uh, for all, whenever you have a prediction model that gives you a predicted value, you can actually use, you don't have to change the model. You can use the model to, to, to make intervals, but you don't have to change the model itself. It works for any model. That's the cool thing. So you don't have to change any. If you wanna know more about this, um, so we have a paper where we use this to, to calibrate prediction intervals for for this Tour de France example. But the early work here is a, a textbook actually from 2005 is probably a really good starting point. Um, and then my, there's many, many papers now, but my two, uh, one of my favorites here are these two papers that give a really nice, I think, intuitive understanding um, of, of this field. And so it's a good starting point. Okay, so the take home message for this part is basically um, for us, it was really a way to connect this human expert, the coach to a prediction model in a, in a way that we can defend physically and the coach hopefully can use. And um, the nice thing about this method is that it's, it gives you valid prediction intervals um, independent of the, the model that you use, uh, as long as the data is exchangeable. So you have this, you can exchange the years and they still hold into the future. The one thing that is different from maybe what you're used to is that the guarantees are not, um, they're not conditional. So usually when you do a prediction, you say, based on my X, I give you a Y. And these guarantees here are not conditioning on a specific predictor value X. They're average or all possible predictor values X. So it's, we call this a marginal uh, coverage. It's a weaker way of coverage that you have than the usual one. But what you get in return is you don't have to make any assumptions on the model itself and it, it applies to all the models that, yeah, as long as the data is exchangeable. So you, you're trading off some of the assumptions for, um, for a bit of a weaker um, guarantee in the, the way the coverage works. Okay. And um, so basically I have now, we, are, we just received money to build a infrastructure at the University of Zurich and the University Hospital of Zurich, where we are going to conformalize everything. And we are basically, um, what we are building is something that is when, whenever a researcher has a prediction model, they can upload it to the platform. And they have to upload a calibration set that they haven't touched or anything. And then we will, we will run this calibration machine, produce intervals, and then they can download the prediction model with uh, intervals included as a free download um, to use and to uh, to use in their papers and and so on and I think this should be something that is should be standard like the way we report p-values and FDRs and confidence intervals for statistical models we should probably do this just standard for prediction uh, because it's really um, um, yeah it's easy to apply and I think intuitive to understand Okay, so these are the two um, the things I talked about. So the left one is the, the link to the paper about the Tour de France. And the right one is the platform that we're building. And um, I'm actually done here. The rest of the slides are, are just in case there are questions and I prepared some answers. Thanks for listening. Okay.